Good evening and welcome to the Forum. I'm John Madison. Tonight's guests are both women. Gwen Lister, a much awarded newspaper editor in Namibia. But first, Busi Sebeko, who is a researcher and economist at the Institute for Economic Justice. Uh, uh, Busi, welcome. Thank you for having me here. Okay, so you're, what it, you're working on the universal basic income or the basic income grant. Um, why should we have one in South Africa? Well, as we've seen during this crisis, um, many people have lost their income, many people have lost their jobs. And what we are seeing is an increase in hunger and food insecurity and destitution generally. And so this is a time where a universal basic income grant is more critical than ever before. It's always been critical, but this current crisis has shown us um, the great scales at which our country really is in a humanitarian crisis. And so we need this universal basic income grant to help families, uh, to help households, um, to help individuals to be able to have their basic rights, right? Their basic rights to social protection, which is outlined by our constitution. And so how would it work? How much money would be given? Would it be a monthly amount? And, and who would get it? Yes, so what we have proposed actually is that um, the universal basic income grant should target 18 to 59, people who are between the ages of 18 to 59, those who are unemployed, those who are in informal employment, and who are adults that are considered to not be economic act economically active. And by economically active, we also include people who are homemakers, right? So that people who undertake, women largely who undertake unpaid care work and households and therefore do not have formal income uh, because we don't consider household work to be work, which is problematic. Um, but what we've suggested is that immediately that the, the COVID-19 350 rand grant should be reinstated until the end of the 21-22 financial year. Um, and it should include caregivers who have been excluded um, based on the criteria that they are beneficiaries um, of grants already. And that's because caregivers are the ones who receive um, the child grant on behalf of their children, but they are not the beneficiaries, right? They are just the caregivers to the beneficiaries. And so we find that very problematic that they've been excluded um, from this grant. So that's the immediate. Um, what we suggest in the short term is that this amount should actually be increased to the food poverty line of 585 rand per month. Um, and so that is sort of, you know, in the short to medium or, or rather the immediate to short term um, is the increase. In the medium term, we propose that this universal basic income grant should actually be increased either to the lower bound poverty line, which is 840 rand, um, or to the upper bound poverty line, which is 1,268 rand. Um, per, 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 sorry, for what, per, for what period is that? The, the medium term. The, the, the 1,200 rand is per month? Yes, per month. Okay. Per month. Um, and so all these figures are per month. So it's, right, it's right. 1,200 rand per month, 585 rand a month, um, 1,268 rand a month. And in fact, we argue that in the long term, um, this amount should be increased such that it is sufficient to meet the needs um, of, of households and individuals rather um, okay. in the long term. I have two practical questions for you, which are really important, and I'm sure a lot of people ask them. The first is, can South Africa afford it, and wh where would the money come from? Because when uh, President Zuma came up with the idea of more money for university students and so on, it came from somewhere. It actually came from uh, primary school education and other places. So where would you take it from? Yes, so we've actually um, done some calculations on how much it would actually cost. Um, and in our universal basic income grant policy brief, we basically put forward proposals that would raise to the amount of 158 billion rand um, for 12 months immediately that could be utilized. Some of these include, for example, a social security tax, um, which would be obviously on the wealthier <laughs> because, you know, we live in a country with great inequality. Um, right. and in inequality is a threat to us all. So it is important that we think about these social security taxes as a way to redistribute wealth and income in our country. We also put forward some suggestions around, for example, a resource rate tax. 
So what does that mean? It means over the next couple of months, we're going to see a commodities boom, right? Meaning that there will be favorable prices towards commodities. And in fact, we should say that once commodities reach a certain profit, um, that profit should be you know, taxed um, because these resources belong to all of us. They are our nation's wealth and therefore they should be taxed um, so that those rewards return back to the people. Um, and we put up across a lot of other proposals, as I've already indicated, a luxury VAT on, you know, on luxury goods. Um, and of course, there's some callbacks, which we also present, which will also come from people receiving the grant themselves, right? Because remember, when people receive money, they spend it in the economy, and some of that money returns back in the form of VAT and other indirect taxes, um, which are, can be gathered from that expenditure. Yes, um, I, 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 I see what you're uh, getting at, and uh, clearly tax is an issue, but I, I just wonder if you haven't got to engage with the sort of other side of the ledger, which is, why, uh, how we generate more wealth as well as how we dis distribute it. Because, I mean, when you talk about resources, our, our, our government policy on mining has been very inefficient. Um, and, our, you know, our policies in other areas, haven't we got to, I mean, because you, you campaign, haven't you also got a campaign for a more effective uh, government in, in, in having policies that will generate wealth, uh, whether it's in, uh, and also use it, use the wealth we have more efficiently. I mean, one, exa one other example is we have, you know, most of our arms deal is sitting, you know, the, the planes we bought are sitting in long-term storage. Now, I mean, that cut level of inefficiency, wouldn't it be important for, for campaigners like yourselves to be holding the government accountable for how it uses uh, the resources it has. Absolutely, I think across civil society there have been a number of campaigns, um, and in fact, at the institute, you know, we would always refer to this issue of state incapacity. That is a real threat um, to some of the proposals. For example, we proposed actually um, a fiscal stimulus package, right? A, a real one that would be aimed um, at growing our economy. Um, in ways that are equitable, but ways that are also not growth for growth's sake, but to say that, you know, we need basic services, um, we need to invest in sectors that have, you know, high employment intensity, um, we need to increase our cap capacity utilization in manufacturing, um, and so forth. So these, these proposals across the board around state efficiency, state capacity, around what sort of macroeconomic policy do we need um, exist. And we've also been very strong in terms of saying that, you know, we can no longer implement austerity or government should not be cutting budgets as a way to resolve the debt issue. And there's a whole theoretical background around that, which I won't get into, but to say that austerity will undermine our economy. Um, more than it will help it. Um, and so, yeah, there, there are a number of proposals from civil society, unions, um, NGOs, and, you know, organizations, grassroots organizations on the ground with regards to these issues. But, but I, I, I want to hold you, uh, ask you to be specific. What, what should government do that it's not doing now that would either save money or create, uh, create greater uh, economic activity? That is, as you say, employment creating economic activity yes so what you know what we proposed and you know written a paper called the fiscal stimulus for south africa is effectively to say government needs to put adequate resources and substantive resources in terms of gdp um towards you know and, and some of them have already laid out here to say we need to invest where there's marginal value where we get the highest examples for example for example, spending on children. Um, so it is not typically what, you know, when we think about economies, um, people would not necessarily go straight to children, but the research has shown that children actually have very high marginal um, value for your bank or your buck, if I could put it that way. So spending on children is very critical because one, it is spending on the future labor force of your country as well. So we need to think not only short term, but long term, what economy are we developing? Um, and what needs to happen now to develop that future economy? Two, we need to, to invest in employment intensive sectors. Um, and to say that, you know, where investment is low, government has to really put 
the money there, right? It's like we cannot wait for private sector to invest there. Um, government must use those fiscal resources to ensure you know that those sectors are growing um, but also that they are you know keeping jobs for example we're seeing now that many people are losing jobs in particular sectors and there's a lack of relief sectoral relief um, that we're seeing and so this is likely to continue going forward so we have to respond to the COVID crisis in itself um, we also argue and i won't go through we've got 10 principles so i won't go through all of them but to say also thinking about green technologies and green jobs and green economy um you know when we, think about ESCOM, when we think about escom you know we need to invest in you know this future economy that we see a just transition that ensures that there's training capacity that ensures that you know people who are currently employed in those sectors as well um you know are able to to move into this green economy that we speak of but also we do argue for for grants um and increases in grants and that's because south africa is demand deficient um and so an economy cannot grow when people are unable to spend we are poor um and which is why this big is so important because 70 percent of adults live below the upper bound poverty line um what kind of economy survives when people are unable to spend and therefore generate further economic activity and so grants are critical because of that because of the inequality in our country um, but also because demand is a critical impact or demand is critically impacts when people actually have the money to spend in the economy so those are just some of them um and i won't go through all of them uh, but they, yeah there's there's many proposals that we put and like i said there's 10 principles they're all contained in a paper i've written a fiscal stimulus for south africa but also the iej is releasing um tomorrow or rather it'll or on Thursday uh, would have released a, a policy brief on how government should be responding to this current moment to but, ensure that the economy thrives. Busi, we're out of time. We'll, we'll, we'll go and look at that policy and we'll have to get you back. Um, that was Busi Sibeka of the Institute for Economic Justice. Uh, we'll be right back talking to Gwen Lister. <laughs> And we're back. Uh, my guest now is Gwen Lister, author of a new book called Comrade Editor on Life, Journalism, and the Birth of Namibia. Uh, Gwen, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the forum. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me. Uh, Gwen, uh, you, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a special pleasure for a number of reasons. I met you when you first moved to Vintuk uh, in the 70s, uh, uh, but Cape Town, where, where I'm broadcasting from, is the last town in South Africa you lived in. You were at the University of Cape Town. After that, you went straight to Vintuk, and you've never looked back. Absolutely, never looked back. Visited once or twice since then, but um, I've been here for the duration. And well, for people who don't know much about you, you the first woman to be editor of a major uh, of an important paper in in the region. Uh, but let's get straight to the start. Um, you arrived in uh, Vintuk, uh, still under uh, South African occupation uh, in the 70s, and you went to work at a newspaper. What was it like? Well, John, it was a real baptism of fire is the short and sweet of it. Um, I started work for a male editor, Hannes Smith, of the Vintuk Advertiser, and he certainly did not want a woman in the newsroom. He believed that women belonged, crudely speaking, in the bedroom and in the kitchen. And so I really had to prove myself that I could be a journalist and a political journalist notwithstanding. Um, so he really laid it on and gave me a very hard time until I eventually managed to prove to him that a woman could, in fact, do the job. Yes, I remember that. Uh, people called him Mull Smitty, Mad Smitty. Um, uh, but he was, he was a very dedicated journalist, and he was really committed to, to sort of honest journalism for Namibia. Absolutely. I mean, Smitty was a real maverick in his own right but an absolute dyed in the wool old hack, as we used to call it in those days. Um, and he was really a journalist 24 seven. He loved what he did. And I must say, he taught me a lot about passion and uh, the work ethic. Uh, so I owe a lot of what I am today, I must say to Smitty, 
notwithstanding his misogyny. Right, and, and it was not just his misogyny you suffered from because, uh, well, at first uh, uh, the company was sold and so the two of you then uh, moved to start another paper together and then uh, he basically dropped you because you became a political hot potato and, and he gave up on you uh, for just to keep his paper going and uh, I think it's something he deeply regretted afterwards. Yes, I think so. I mean, in subsequent years, because that happened in 1984, I had started the <clears throat> Vintuk Observer with him in 1978. And in 1984, when political pressure was really coming down and my reporting wasn't popular in the eyes of the South African authorities at the time, Smitty basically sold me out to get advertising. And many years later, when we met, he would actually admit to me that uh, really he had supped with the devil were the words he used um, in order to get rid of me. Right, but the f consequence of all that was that you then started your own paper, The Namibian, which has really become legendary. It's won awards all over the world and you've been honored all over the world uh, by journalist institutions and, and press freedom uh, awards. Um, but of course you, you, you took the decision to support SWAPO, but you never joined Sw SWAPO. Well, John, it was, it's, it's, it's an issue that many people talk about still today. I mean, I think uh, we didn't support SWAPO in as much as at the time, our kind of aspirations for Namibia coincided. Right. When I started the Namibian in 1985, uh, we had a very clear mission which was to agitate for and to be activists for the implementation of a United Nations settlement plan, which would allow Namibians to free themselves from colonial rule and basically hold elections and determine their own future. So to a large extent, we were kind of aligned with SWAPO because of course that was their wish for the country as well. And in the reporting of the newspaper, which was really to also expose human rights violations and happening under the jackboot of apartheid at the time. I mean, obviously that uh, kind of resonated with SWAPO as well. So, I mean, shortly after independence in 1990, uh, the Namibian really asserted its independence as we'd always done. Um, and we held the new government, the new SWAPO government to account. And that of course, in turn did not earn us popularity with the former liberation movement. Before we get to that, because I do want to ask you about that, uh, because it has so many resonances in South Africa as well. Um, but uh, uh, under apartheid, you were jailed, you were harassed. I think you were jailed while you were pregnant. Uh, uh, your, your places, your, uh, uh, your newspaper was firebombed many times. Uh, uh, I mean, the harassment was pretty extensive. And, and of course, uh, friends of yours like Anton Lebovsky were, were murdered. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, the years of the Observer were pretty tough, but the years when I, after I founded the Namibian in 85 were even worse. I mean, yeah. the authorities did not want a newspaper, an independent newspaper, which they perceived to be pro swapo uh, to see the light of day. So, of course, they tried method and every tactic they could to really put the fear of God into us and get us to stop doing what we were doing. Um, so it, it, it was a very, very hard time indeed. They perceived the newspaper just by virtue of it being called at the time, the Namibian in, in what was then Southwest Africa as yeah. of course a swapper mouthpiece. And so of course, not only myself, but the staff were intimidated for the next couple of years until independence finally happened in 1990. Yes, uh, I, I suppose for, for, for South Africans, uh, they might not appreciate uh, the, the sort of odd uh, uh, status of, of Southwest Africa as it was then. I, I had forgotten, but you, uh, I see it in the book, that you and I drove together down to Wolfers Bay for a SWAPO conference. And so SWAPO was legal um, and Wolfers Bay was under South African control. And I suppose that's partly why they harassed you, but never 
but, but, but there was a limit to what they felt they could do because they were in the spotlight of the United Nations. Exactly. I mean, it was kind of an invidious uh, position that SWAPA was in. You know, as the ANC was banned in South Africa, SWAPA was not banned in Namibia, but at the same time, um, it was obviously not really, uh, it was certainly frowned upon its activities and so on. Meetings were not allowed or were broken up. Um, that Congress you, you referred to, I think, was in 1976 right. when we came down together to, to cover that. Um, and as I said, it was always a strange position for SWAPO to be in. And I mean, uh, uh, at some point in 1984, when I was arrested at then Young Smuts Airport in Johannesburg with documents, among others, the SWAPO Constitution, um, there was a court hearing in which they obviously determined that SWAPA was not illegal and therefore their constitution could not be de deemed illegal. But at the time, those were regarded as banned documents. So it was kind of always a very fuzzy picture of SWAPO's kind of legitimate status. And as you say, the, the South Africans were very conscious of the international eye that was cast on Namibia, Southwest Africa at the time. So they were sometimes quite cautious and never actually took the step of officially banning SWAPO as a liberation movement or political uh, We're, we're going to have to go to a break, break fairly soon, but I, just while we're on that particular period, I, I was in Namibia, well, in Vintuk at that time, because of, of a court, a, a trial that was going on, and I realized when I read your book, your lawyers were the same lawyers who had been ill infiltrated by the security police, who in this other case I was covering had no less than four agents inside the attorneys representing SWAPO and later representing you. Absolutely. And in fact, that's one of the reasons I think that in that case, uh, the death penalty, which had been uh, um, given to one of the, the SWAPO activists in that case was actually lifted mainly because there had been interference from the security police in the legal process. Right. And um, um, to explain, it'll become apparent uh, a little later on, but even in, in those early days, I mean, when, uh, when the Namibian was your paper, but swap, uh, South Africa was still in power, you were interested in human rights violations on all sides, including SWAPO. And you, you, you found that SWAPO was detaining people, but it was very hard to get any information about that. Absolutely. I mean, I must admit that I think we got on to that story a little bit late, but we did nevertheless. And that was, of course, the, the, the reports of atrocities in SWAPO camps in Angola, Lubango more specifically, where a number of SWAPO uh, uh, people in exile were labeled as spies for the South African regime and were punished and obviously held and detained illegally and without any kind of trial. And a number of them died in detention. It's a subject that SWAPO still doesn't want to really talk about today. Um, I think they were a little afraid of opening what is probably a Pandora's box to kind of give the de former detainees access to perhaps the courts and demanding some kind of a reparation for what happened to them. And of course, SWAPO also feel that the post-independence policy of reconciliation announced by the founding president, uh, Sam Nyoma, should sort of cover the wounds of the past on both sides, whether it was atrocities by the South African regime or those committed by SWAPO in the camps in Angola. We're going to uh, have to take a break. We'll be right back with the fascinating Gwen Lister. And we're back talking to Gwen Lister, author of Comrade Editor. Uh, Gwen, um, to understand the sort of strangeness of, of the times, of the country, and of your, uh, your situation, when you were trying to start the Namibian, I mean, you, it obviously seemed like an almost impossible task, uh, and especially because the UN had declared that SWAPO was the authentic voice of, of, of Namibians, 
Uh, you couldn't get funding without Sam Nyoma's support, the, the leader of, of, the, of SWAPO and persona non grata in Namibia, and of course later the first, uh, to become the first president. But he then decided to endorse you, and he, he admired you and, and what you were doing and wanted you to help you. Exactly. Uh, I took a bit of work, but um, after I visited him in Lusaka in 1984, he wasn't very keen on the idea of supporting a new independent uh, newspaper in Namibia in the sense that he would give the go-ahead to donors abroad to actually get money into the country to enable us to start the paper. And so at the time he said, oh, well, come into exile and you can work for Swapo Media in exile. And this was exactly what I didn't want. Um, as you know, at the time, there'd been many revelations about white spies in the ranks of the ANC in exile. And I certainly want, didn't want to be appended with that label in any case. But I did believe that the struggle was at home on the ground and that it was very important to show to the world what was happening to Namibians, especially SWAPO supporting citizens under uh, apartheid in, in Namibia. And so finally, uh, he said that he would approve and uh, our seed funding came from then the European community, which basically allowed us to start the Namibian in 1985. But to get to that point, you had to hold your ground, insisting that the Namibian, while sympathetic to the cause of Namibian independence and democracy, uh, would remain an independent paper and, and the journalism would remain independent. Absolutely. Um, and as I say, even though people do say there was a swap of buyers in the years prior to independence, we've always maintained that we have been absolutely independent and nobody ever dictated what we should do at any given time in the history of the Namibian. Um, and I think that only became clear after independence when of course we started holding the new government to account as we would any other government and the South African regime before that. And of course, this again, didn't make us very popular with SWAPO post-independence. Um, and Sam Nyoma, who had initially approved the funding for the Namibian to start in 1985, then later, of course, imposed a ban on the newspaper in 2000 in terms of government not being allowed to advertise in the newspaper and or purchase copies. So the, 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 the solidarity, if you like, with, uh, between ourselves and Swapo kind of did a full circle um, and came to that eventually. But before it got to that point, I mean, they obviously saw it was might go in that direction, but before that, they, off, they dangled baubles in front of you, didn't they? They offered you uh, to be the Minister of Information, didn't they? They did. I mean, immediately after independence, I was approached by uh, then published the information secretary of SWAPO, Hidipo Hamatenya, yes. um, who basically offered me, um, with cabinet approval, the post of Minister of Information and Broadcasting. And it was quite a humorous meeting because we'd known each other for quite some time. And I basically laughed at him and said, I realize exactly what you're trying to do, and that is to neutralize me. Um, the other thing I did tell them, and, and, and it's something that has manifested in Namibia post-independence, and I oppose it tooth and nail, and that is the issue of entitlement. With many people who had participated in one way or another in the struggle for Namibia's freedom, uh, who really expected some kind of reward. And I certainly never expected, neither did I want that, and so I told him that I was very happy to remain exactly where I was um, in journalism at an independent newspaper and that I would continue to do that and didn't really want that or the subsequent uh, post they offered me of taking an ambassador post somewhere in the world. So I declined both of those offers. No, those weren't the only offers. You were also, I think, uh, offered a farm. Oh, yes, uh, that was an entitlement in terms of anyone who is determined to be a veteran status um, from the struggle. And uh, they gave me or accorded me that status. And along with that came a, a, a farm and I think a small amount of money, or, well, not a small amount, 200,000. But I declined both. And to today, although I guess I am considered a veteran, 
I haven't actually applied or got the status of having that card to show that I'm a veteran of the struggle. And as I say, as a journalist, that's what I've always been. That's what I always will be. And so reward really was not part of what I was interested in. And then the other option was to bring you into the broadcaster. And I think there, there were two phases to that. One was to run the, the broadcaster. And then at, at another stage, uh, like me, in fact, you were on the board of the, uh, of the broadcaster for a while. But you found that an untenable situation because you were, uh, they didn't want the kind of independence you wanted. Well, exactly. I mean, after turning down the ministerial post and an ambassador position, um, Hamatenya then offered me to head up or become the director general of what was then to become the Namibia Broadcasting Corporation. Again, I turned that down, but I realized that the um, change, if you like, from the former days of the SWA Broadcasting Corporation to the Namibia Broadcasting Corporation would require a lot of effort, a lot of training of journalists in order to adapt to a new and more free environment. Um, and so I said I would uh, uh, serve on the board of the NBC to try and help that process along. Um, but it wasn't only after a few months I decided I would resign, mainly because the priority seemed to be to order new BMWs for the senior staff at the, at the Paris Staple. And then I decided I, I was not going to have my way. I was not going to be able to ensure that the monies there were were poured into retraining staff, um, improving journalism standards and so on. But then in fact, it was again, the issue of reward and giving people top salaries and, and, and fancy cars. Now, uh, uh, in some senses, South Africa has made a lot of the same mistakes that were made in Namibia. But one thing, one area where I think we did learn, at least some of us, I was in uh, uh, Namibia for those first elections. And I remember watching what was then still called the Southwest Africa Broadcasting Corporation. And I watched the coverage of the election. Of course, the election was extraordinary. It was the first time we all saw those long lines of people patiently waiting to vote uh, and, and so committed to having their chance to vote. Uh, but the coverage on, by the broadcaster was really very biased and old-fashioned and colonial and awful. And we determined that in South Africa in 1994, we would get do, do a better job. And to some extent, I think we, we, we set South Africa on a better path, although it's been pretty rocky since. Yeah, I think uh, that's a very valid point. And of course, the whole aspect of the UN elections were that they were supposed to be free and fair. And so, of course, with a um, UN special representative in place, along with the former South African Administrator General, to manage the process, uh, there's no doubt that the South African dirty tricks were still at work during that period to right. try and ensure mm -hmm that they basically the internal groups uh, under the umbrella of the Democratic Turnhalle Alliance, which were kind of regarded at the time as puppets of the South Africa, and obviously South Africa would have preferred had they come to power because they would have been a lot more friendly uh, to the former regime. But uh, so all efforts really, including use of the then SWA Broadcasting Corporation, were deployed to ensure that the um, internal forces at least would get some kind of showing in the elections. So of course, yeah, the, the coverage was pretty skewed, although I don't think it ever really altered the free and fair status of the elections that was subsequently announced by the uh, special representative. But it's clear, I think, from subsequent elections, in 1990, Swapo came to power with a simple majority. And up after that, um, it was a two thirds majority. So I think it seems quite clear with hindsight that uh, South African dirty tricks still uh, managed to have some kind of impact right. to stop her from getting that two thirds in 1990. That's interesting. I, mean, I must say, when we looked at it from South Africa's point of view, in terms of the SABC and the future, we, 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 we didn't think it would change the outcome uh, or that it changed the outcome there. But what it did change was the quality of the democracy. 
absolutely, absolutely. And I think a lot of lessons were learned from those days because there were, of course, a number of groups kind of assessing uh, the Swabi Sea and its coverage and how, to what extent it was uh, skewed. I was up to the elections, a persona non grata. I was not allowed to be interviewed by the Swabi Sea. I was one of them on their, their sort of, if you like. Um, and that didn't change much over the election period. And of course, post-independence, uh, the NBC as it is now is still in a strange position. It's never been, um, and this was another reason I left the board, is because they removed the word autonomous from the statute of the NBC, which we hoped would be a public broadcaster rather than a state broadcaster. But I'm afraid to date, um, and a lot of African governments still find it very difficult to let go of state broadcasters because they're seen as very important um, in exercising the majority political party's views and opinions and putting their ministers on air 24-7. Yeah, and, and of course, we in South Africa, we've had a, a seesaw relationship with that whole issue of independence at SABC. There were periods where it became very, very... Uh, uh, pro ANC and then periods where it became more independent. I think it's probably somewhat more independent now, uh, but it's a constant battle. It's not something that ever ends, is it? Well, it isn't. And, and you know, I mean, the struggle for independent journalism, given also all the constraints they currently face, you know, in terms of sustainability and so on, is also never a struggle that's fully won. I, I mean, I say that quite frequently, especially in regard to Namibia which is now uh, sort of tops the, the rankings of the Reporter Sans Frontier uh, Press Freedom Index in, in Africa. Um, but you know, it, it's only constant vigilance and keeping an eye all the time that really has to ensure that press freedom will survive. But it's not an easy task and uh, I don't think it ever really will be, even in established democracies that should know better. That's right. Gwen, we're going to have to take a break. When we come back, I want to look ahead and to, the, to where we are now and where we're going. And we're back talking to Gwen Lister, author of Comrade Editor. Gwen, uh, uh, you, you're talking to us via Zoom from, from Vintuk. Um, when you look ahead or when you look to where we are now, uh, are you disappointed in where Namibia is and do you, how do you see that and how do you see where we are in South Africa by comparison? You know, John, um, that's an interesting question because I must say, you know, looking at the book, which is kind of follows my tra trajectory as a sort of very idealistic young white South African uh, then who really wanted to, to make change happen in terms of apartheid and my chosen path took me here as a journalist to Namibia where I put down roots and now obviously consider myself as a Namibian in bone and marrow. Although I might be an adopted daughter of the soil, I'm yeah. nevertheless a Namibian now. But, um, and obviously in doing this book, uh, I had to do a lot of soul searching uh, about that because where I wanted the country to be and I do recall President Sam Nyoma many years ago in an interview telling me before independence that he wanted Namibia to be Africa's first success story. Yes. And he put it like that. And that was something I could absolutely resonate with that sentiment. Yeah. Um, and that's what I wanted too. So I think my idealism uh, all these decades later has been tempered by the realities I think one mustn't underestimate, though, that we did get our freedom, that Namibia has a pretty darn good constitution. Right. It does provide for things like press freedom. We did abolish the death penalty. Uh, there were a number of very progressive things that happened uh, when Namibia became independent. But as for the search for economic independence, for a sort of good standard of living for the 2.6, whatever it is, million inhabitants of Namibia, that has been very elusive. So in many ways, we won the political battle, but the, the fight for economic um, well-being uh, for Namibia has not been won. And I mean, a large part of that is due, I think, to a government 
um, that developed skewed priorities that forgot many of the ideals of the struggle days of the 70s and the 80s, and that implemented this kind of unspoken policy of entitlement, which has led in turn to greed and to corruption. Um, and of course, so in many ways, yes, I think Namibia could have been a success story. It's not. Uh, I guess it's not too late for it still to be the case in the future. Obviously, also the COVID pandemic has hit us very, very hard uh, economically and in a number of other ways. So it's a bit of a disappointment to me, yes. But would I have done it? Would I have done what I did again in order really for our people not only to be free, but also to basically have bread on the table and be able to feed, clothe, house and educate themselves? I think absolutely I would. Um, but I think there've been lessons learned along the way and maybe future generations of journalists will keep an eye and future generations of politicians will hopefully become a lot more honest and more caring and, and really public servants in the true sense of the word, rather than looking uh, towards greed and self-entitlement. When you, when you look at South Africa and what we've been through with state capture and President Jacob Zuma, uh, who of course this week finally got uh, held accountable by the Constitutional Court and it looks like he's gonna be going to jail. Um, how, how does it look to you from there? Is it the same? Is it worse? Is it better? Well, you know, John, it, it, it's always been said, and I mean, we know Namibia's economic dependence, especially in regard to imports on South Africa, is still very strong and very real. Um, so in a sense, we've never managed to extricate ourselves economically from South Africa. And it's always been said, if, if South Africa sneezes, we catch a cold. So definitely, there have always been a lot of similarities between the liberation movements um, ANC on, on that side of the fence and the and Swapo here. A lot of the same mistakes have been made. Um, so we're seeing a kind of pattern repeat itself. Um, and South Africa equally is in not in the greatest economic situation right now. But I mean, it is encouraging to see that something like the Constitutional Court can still take a decision like that uh, about uh, former President Zuma. Uh, whether it happens and whether something like that could happen here, we don't know. Uh, Namibia just recently had, of course, two years ago, these fish rot uh, revelations where two of our key ministers are in fact still jailed uh, as a result of corruption on a grand scale in the fishing industry. So it gives one a little bit of hope that perhaps um, with more commitment that we can tackle this issue of corruption and get the money that has been stolen kind of back to improving the well-being and of the people and creating jobs. So maybe I think there are a lot of similarities and hopefully our paths will improve in the coming months and years. But it, it's also a question of leadership, isn't it? I mean, when you look at uh, one of the things that worries us in South Africa, there are many talented young South Africans coming up uh, uh, who get, get to universities and come out with good qualifications, but they're not going into politics. Um, the, right. you, know, you know, the kind of idealistic people we knew in those days in both Namibia and South Africa who were prepared to sacrifice everything to be in the ANC or SWAPO or many other organizations. You're not seeing that now. Is, is, do, you, uh, do you see a younger generation in Namibia going into politics, the quality people, the people with vision and, and an understanding of economic development, or do you see the same malaise there? Well, in a sense, I think I see the same malaise. The problem being, it's not as though there aren't those talented, really gifted young people with commitment and you know honesty, and many of those virtues we kind of saw a lot more of in the struggle years. But the point is, are they interested in politics? And most of them seem to be going into business. Um, and this is another thing that they are, there's an absolute dearth, uh, I think in South Africa, as well as here, of role models for the youth. So they look to the older generation who are busy filling their pockets and the youth are thinking, well, why shouldn't we be doing the same? And uh, you know, there's the slogan in Namibia where people are saying, it's our turn to eat. And it, it's kind of a, what's that word, a, a, 
it's definitely meaning, well, we need to get money, we need to get wealth, and, and, and all the impetus is in that sense, not in creating role models, not people going into literature, in the arts, um, and in various fields where they can make a difference uh, to our societies, but the attraction to politics is not great right now. Uh, maybe that changes in the future, I hope it does, because the youth keep on talking about the older generation, which is kind of hanging on to power. But my main question is, even if they were in power in their stead, would they be making a difference or would but they be doing simply the same thing? But having said all that, Gwen, you have left a legacy. The Namibian still does good work and you've it's now in the hands of black Namibians. Um, so there, 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 there is the potential and there is... There are, are legacy uh, projects that have value. Absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, the Namibian is, is a solid, still a newspaper that produces good journalism. I mean, something we're looking at worldwide to how to sustain quality professional journalism, win back people's trust, because it seems that, you know, we tend to blame the digital media for, for what's happened, particularly to newspapers. But, you know, sometimes we need to deeply introspect and say to what extent have journalists or have the traditional news med media, as it's known, contributed to their own demise. So I think the youth really are up for a great challenge in the same way as I had to fight the battle for sustainability of the Namibian from donor funding uh, back in the early 90s. Now, uh, the youth in journalism have to fight a similar but different battle how to basically keep good journalism alive in whatever form it exists, either online or in print or whatever. And I think there's a lot of skill out there and a lot of talent, and I'm holding thumbs that they can win this battle as well as we won that battle back in the day. Is, is the Namibian alone in Namibia as an independent media outlet, or are there others in broadcasting, radio, etc.? No, uh, Namibia, I mean, there are, you know, some of them are, uh, the newspapers particularly are owned by fairly big um, conglomerates, but there's definitely a tendency to allowing um, independent editorial content. So I think there's quite a lively uh, uh, print media in Namibia. Uh, it's been kind of uh, reduced recently because of the impact of COVID um, and issues facing print media but there is still quite a lively media, both uh, in print and in radio. There's quite a lively radio sector. A lot of it is commercial radio, but there is a, a growing community radio sector in Namibia. So I think there is some hope that we'll definitely keep the flame of independent media alive in a number of areas here at home. Um, on that positive note, we have to end. Gwen Lister, thanks so much for being on the show. Her book is Comrade Editor. I strongly recommend it. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, I'm John Madison. Hope to see you again next week.